Well, good, good evening, all. We're glad to have each of you online with us. We're going to go ahead and take a break from logic this week and uh, continue a study from the book of Daniel. So if you would be turning over to that book, we're going to see how far we can get tonight. The name Daniel, the word Daniel, simply means God is my judge. Since it's uh, been a little while since we've talked about this, I want to, I guess, by way of introduction, go over a few things that we've already talked about, but it has been quite some time, just to kind of serve as a refresher. This name, Daniel, presents a key theme for this book, and that is God is my judge. He's ultimately the, ju the judge of the world. He will judge all nations of mankind. And as we see from this book, he uses other nations to prescribe his wrath upon unfaithful Israel and even unfaithful Judah. So who's to say that filthy, morally speaking, America is not being judged now? A second theme that we can see from this book is that God is in control. God is the judge. God is in control. Those are our main themes there. Now, if we consider Daniel as a writing prophet, he did his work as a writing prophet around the same time as Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We know that Jeremiah did his work in Jerusalem, both before and during the Babylonian captivity, in roughly years 626 to 528 B.C. Ezekiel doing his work in Babylon, but among the captives, throughout the years roughly 592 to 570 B.C. And our particular study, that is Daniel, doing his work within the city or the capital of Babylon, roughly 605 to 586 B.C. Now, we're going to go ahead and read the text at this time. We'll read the first seven verses, Daniel chapter 1. Verse 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, the, the God mentioned here is more than likely Marduk because Nebuchadnezzar seemed to take a liking to this Marduk. Uh, we'll continue with verse 3, and it says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in, who, in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such has, the, has had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourished them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Now, we see that though we don't know exactly how many youths were taken, nor do we know the countries of origin of each of these, of these youths taken, none of them excelled over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, 
and Azariah. Now, the changing of their names is significant. Because the name Daniel, as we said earlier, Jehovah or God is my judge. Well, his name was changed to Belteshazzar, which is a reference to Bel, which is a reference to Marduk. And it uh, points out basically Marduk to protect the king. With Hananiah, his name is God is gracious. Well, his name was changed to Shadrach, <clears throat> which has to do with the command of Aku. Aku is the Babylonian moon god. And uh, Mishael, uh, is, it means who is what God is. And his name was changed to Meshach, which is one belonging to Aku. And Azariah, Yahweh has helped. So if you put, well, uh, and his name was changed to Abednego, which is a servant of Nego. Now the specifics I, were, I was not able to find, but this God of Babylon is associated with light. So Abednego would be a servant of Nego, the God of light. Now, if you look at these four boys' names, the Hebrew side of it, God is my judge. God is gracious. God is what God is, and God has helped. Now, when they were take, take, taken captive, at some point in their captivity, their names were changed to fit the Babylonian culture, the Babylonian religion. Now, picking back up in... Verse 8, we'll read the first half of that verse. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Now, once you take a look at what these boys went through, and it's a question that comes up today quite frequently, is why? Did these boys have to suffer? Why were these boys suffering? Well, primarily because they purposed to be faithful to God. <clears throat> Yet they were still taken captive. And then once captive, they were mutilated. They were turned into eunuchs. This would be quite humiliating for some teenage boys. Quite a painful process. And under the law of Moses would come with certain restrictions because they are now eunuchs. Now, some have attempted to use this argument of suffering as a way of disproving God's existence and his love. However, what we must realize is that not only is God love and mercy, but he is also justice and wrath. Two concepts that most people do not want to talk about whenever we discuss God. Out of all the kings of Judah, we know that only four, four kings were good, that is, upright before God. Israel had eventually rebelled against God, and now even Judah had become even more so. They had become corrupt. They had left their first love. They were even worse than Sodom. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 16. Thus, the nation of Judah deserved to be punished. Now, does this mean that every single person in that country was sinful in those two tribes? Absolutely not. However, if that's the case, then why must these four boys suffer along with the evildoers? Well, we see a universal law, and that is the innocent suffer for the sins of the guilty. Not that they themselves are guilty of those sins, but all sin has a consequence, sometimes multiple consequences. And as a whole, the nation of Judah had fallen away from God. And because of that, the nation of Judah deserved to be punished. 
They deserve to receive God's wrath. And in this instance, that wrath was discharged by the nation of Babylon under guidance of King Nebuchadnezzar. We see all the time that children suffer for the sins of their parents. And even vice versa, parents suffer for the sins of their children. Again, pointing out that they are not guilty of those sins, but they are receiving the consequences of them. This really all stems from man's free moral agency. A quick example of that would be abortion today. How many children have we murdered as a nation? Each of those unborn babies have suffered the consequences of their parent or parents' decisions. Notice, though, that in this example, the child is not guilty of the sin itself. However, they did suffer due to the wrongdoing itself. In much more of a broad scope, I think we've used this example before, but you take a pot of boiling water and you drop an egg in it. What happens to the egg? It becomes hard. What happens to a potato that you drop in boiling water? Well, it becomes soft. Taking that a little bit step further, what happens if you put coffee beans in boiling water? Well, it becomes something else. You see, not only is God using the nation of Babylon to punish the wickedness that was found in Judah, but also serves as a test of faithfulness for those who were living faithfully to God while in Judah. The same justice that was exhibited, the same wrath that was being shown to Judah, different people, different calibers of, of people react differently. And we see that these four boys, even though in the midst of this suffering, this captivity, this dealing of wrath, they rose to the occasion. They chose to be faithful to God. Now we'll pick back up in the second half of verse 8. It says they, nor did they choose to defile themselves the wine which the king drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Verse 9, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the, we'll go ahead and stop there for a quick. Now we read in this verse, verse and a half, if you will, that Daniel purposed to not defile himself, not only with the meat that the king offered, but also the wine that was offered. The food and drink that the king offered these eunuchs over a period of three years. Now we're kind of getting a, a step back, if you will, in uh, the first verses that we read, the total timeline is three years. But these verses, this time has not really started yet. So Daniel, not willing to violate the laws of God that he was under, requested that he not defile himself with the king's meat and drink. Now, why might this be an issue? Well, we've already pointed out that Nebuchadnezzar's patron deity is Marduk. This was not a Jewish nation. This was not a godly nation. Though they had the opportunity, no doubt, to be faithful to God, because keep in mind that all other nations in existence at this time period were under patriarchy. Every other nation but Israel was under patriarchy. So they had the requirements that God set forth upon them. Yet when they were found unfaithful, God used his wrath through other nations to destroy them. And oftentimes it was Israel that pronounced this wrath. Either way, this food, this drink would have been offered more than likely to the false gods of Babylon, particularly and more than likely Marduk. And because of this, Daniel does not wish to partake in the eating of this food nor of the drink. 
he really gives an application to Romans chapter 14, where we're not supposed to uh, uh, wound the conscience of a weaker brother. Do these deity, are they really anything to talk about? Not at all. But Babylon thinks these false gods are real. So he refuses to eat this food that has more than likely been offered to their as a sacrifice to these gods. Now notice how Daniel went about dealing with this situation. We see that Daniel was discharging his obligation to God, and that is not partaking of this food, because more than likely, this food and drink was not up to par with respect to the law of Moses. Did Daniel make a stir? Did he riot? Did he flip over tables, burn chariots? No, we don't see that happening. Daniel was polite as he addressed his superiors. Instead of causing a stir, he requested instead of demanding. This is similar to how Paul behaved in front of Felix in Acts chapter 24, verse 3, where Paul says, most noble Felix. Was Felix really all that noble? Nothing but a heathen. However, Paul had respect for the office that Felix upheld. Likewise, Daniel had respect for the prince of the eunuchs, and maybe not necessarily the, the man himself. So he requested these things and not demanded. Now, regarding verse 9, we see that Daniel um, was met with kindness and compassion in the eyes of the prince of the eunuchs. This is a pretty big deal. You think of how much blessing a company nowadays will gain by hiring a Christian. And I'm not talking about somebody that's milk toast, clinging to the Bible loosely, but someone who is indeed faithful. Do you think that boss really has to be worried about whether or not that Christian's stealing the inventory? Whether they're lying to customers or even suppliers of whatever good that they're trying to to sell? Do you think that Christian's going to have to be or going to be dishonest with anyone there, especially if you're offering a service? Absolutely not. Christians stick out because there are certain things they refuse to do and there are certain things that they will do. Daniel and these three other boys are no different. They were strictly adhering to the law of Moses. And because of that, they stuck out. They were different from all those around them. And because of this, specifically Daniel, he was in favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. But it must not come as any surprise to us because, again, this is another universal law or principle that the clean cut, the upright, those who present themselves in an upright manner are typically subject to the delight and admiration of others. They might not like certain things about you, but overall, they have nothing to complain about. When you're doing the right thing in all that you do, people take note of that. And they may not like you, but they will certainly respect you. Evidently, this has been the case for quite some time. Because this is the situation that Daniel and these three boys find themselves in. Now think about this today. Anytime a teenager like this is seen, there's comments or compliments that typically follow. It might be stated that they've had a good upbringing. Gentlemen that open the door for folks say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Maybe not so much anymore nowadays, but that was a respectful thing to do. Nowadays, you don't know what kind of can of worms you're opening by saying, sir, or ma'am. But you can still be polite. 
respectful of others, and people take note of that. Now contrast this with those teenagers that are unruly, overly rambunctious, riotous, and those with a bad attitude in general. How are they typically seen? What type of attitude are they typically met with? Now, this shows the words of Solomon to be true in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. It says, when a man's ways please Jehovah, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Again, our enemies are really the enemies of God. But when you're doing righteous things and you're living rightly, they might not like you because of that, but they will respect you. These four boys stood out because of their faithfulness to God. Now, picking back up in verse 10, it says, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sword? Then shall ye make me in danger of my head to the king. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar had pronounced a command that all these captive children were to have the same diet, the same meat from his table, the same wine from his table. And this prince of the eunuchs was going to be held accountable for how each of these youths turned out in this period of three years. And if these children, specifically Daniel and the other three boys, if they came out looking worse than the others, the other captives, this meant his head would be chopped off. And we know how monarchies of old operated. You can see this in the book of Esther. The queen, if the king didn't like what was said or done, off with your head. So this prince of the eunuchs obviously is, is treading lightly, not just from a political standpoint, but a, a point of self-preservation. So he's concerned about being put to death because of these four boys and their rejection of the king's meal, king's food, king's drink. <clears throat> now, as we read in verse 5, King Negative, King Nebuchadnezzar elevated these youths to a higher state of affairs in his kingdom. Because of this higher elevation, they were given the very best. Better food, better education, and because of this, they were held to a higher standard. The king expected these youths to be prepared to serve him in the palace. Each of them would have different, uh, or be, be serving in different capacities, but they were expected to be able to discharge their obligations to the best of their abilities. We, well, I would point out, I don't think we mentioned it earlier, but these youths that were taken captive specifically for this purpose were the cream of the crop. They already had a good background in education. They were more handsome, if you will, than some of their uh, contemporaries. These were the best of the best, really the best that Judah had to offer in any other countries that Nebuchadnezzar had taken captives from. By looking forward a little bit to Daniel chapter 3, verse 19, we see that Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar was indeed ruthless towards any who would disobey him. That is, of course, a reference to the fiery furnace. Those who would disobey his law were guilty of death. No doubt this has happened before and as throughout his ruling, obviously because the prince of the eunuchs knows this. He's afraid of being put to death if these boys are not up to the standard that's been placed before them. 
So should we be surprised that this prince had such a response? He feared for his life because he knew exactly how his master is. Now, picking back up in verse 11, it says, Then Daniel said to, to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So this, if you will, would be the second in command to the prince of the eunuchs. So Daniel is not going to be able to reason with the prince of the eunuchs as far as getting his way, and that is to be able to practice their religion before God, to not be defiled by the king's meat and drink. So they, he approaches Melzar. Verse 12, continuing his, his talk with Melzar, says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat, and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. In verse 14, he says, So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. So keep in mind, this period of time would take place over three years. They were expected to have the king's rations for three years. So what would 10 days really be? It's a good time for an experiment. And evidently, Melzar was a little bit more of a reasonable individual. So Daniel was able to make his plea known to him. We see that Daniel beseeches Melzar. This is an earnest plea. He's begging Melzar that he and the other three Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah could be excused from eating the king's designated rations. This food and drink, as we've stated, stated, would have more than likely been offered to the Babylonian gods. Again, more than likely Marduk. It is also unlikely that these king's rations would have been approved under the law of Moses. More than likely unclean food would be provided to them. But as we point out, Daniel, at least the manual, the, the, uh, the way Daniel is, is going through and talking, he's not causing a stir. He's not being unruly. He's making reasonable requests. He's being respectful. And even taking that a step further, He's not asking for specifically clean animals. He's not making those unreasonable requests, unreasonable from the standpoint of, do you really think Babylon would have any idea what he's talking about? I need clean animals to eat. More than likely, they would not grant his request because they would consider that unreasonable. But what exactly does he uh, request? Instead of making specific requests for food, he requests pulse, which are simple vegetables, and water. He also offers the test. After 10 days, let Melzar decide which group of children has performed better the children that ate of the king's portion or the four boys that came from Judah. Now, realize what these boys have done. They found a way to be faithful to God under the circumstances that they were in. They found a way to fulfill their obligation to Melzar and to the prince of the eunuchs and to King Nebuchadnezzar. They're satisfying four people, four persons, the king, the prince of the eunuchs, Melzar, and Jehovah God himself. These boys were dedicated to God and the law of Moses. Now we as Christians can and should learn many things from these four boys. 
in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You see, these boys were not only talking the talk, but they were walking the walk. They found a way to not sin before God, yet still please the king, the prince of the eunuchs, and even Melzar. Picking back up in uh, verse 15. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. So obviously the way that Daniel presented the test that he offered was much better than the food of the king's table. Verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Even though these boys were in adverse situations, God took care of them. Judah was being punished, yet these four boys were doing everything in their power to remain faithful to God. And they were blessed because of that. They were given those tools needed to excel in the positions that they were in. And Daniel, Daniel even received the understanding of visions and dreams. Now, verse 18, it says, Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. So in between verse 16 and 18, three years have passed. The 10 the 10 day probation period, if you will, the experiment time has passed. Males are obliged, gave them their, their vegetable stew, if you will. And of course their water. And after those 10 days, they looked better than the other youths. And because of that, for the, for the extent of those three years, these four boys were permitted to remain on that diet of vegetables and water. In verse 18, we, we see that they're now being presented to the king. Verse 19, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Now, over this period of time, the four boys, as we read in verse 17, God blessed them with knowledge and in skill and all learning and wisdom. So they were able to excel in their education that was received at the hand of the king. And because of their faithfulness, because of the providence of God, these four Judah boys, boys from Judah, were far beyond anyone else that was taken captive. And among them all was found none like these four boys. And because of this, they were able to stand before the king. They were able to meet his requirements. They passed his test. They are found faithful to his standard. Verse 20, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. So not only did they excel well beyond the fellow captives, but they were even 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers employed by King Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> now, while this astrology might not be the full-fledged um, goofiness that it is today this what we know of today as astrology where you read the newspaper and you get your sign read or do you go to some 
fortune teller in a hut, get them to tell your future. All of that has its roots from Babylon. They, uh, they enjoyed looking at the stars and they enjoyed, I guess, make believe, if you will, because all that's a bunch of porcus baptismus. Verse 21, it says, and Daniel continued even until the first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel was in power, if you will, in position all the way into the reign of King Cyrus. <clears throat> now chapter 2 says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Verse 3, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee in the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. King Nebuchadnezzar is an educated man. He knows better if you're going to get an authentic dream telling. It's not just, it's easy to say, we're going to give you the interpretation once we know the dream. The king puts the test to them. You've got to tell me my dream and the interpretation. Otherwise, you will be cut in pieces. Now, this obviously would be on the mind, as we read early in verse 10 of chapter 1. The prince of eunuchs knows very well how King Nebuchadnezzar can be. No doubt he really means these words. To cut these individuals in pieces. Verse 6, but if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time. Because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Verse 10, the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, Lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well, there's at least one individual that can. And we know him. It's Daniel. Verse 12, for this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And, de and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his followers to be slain. So now we see that Daniel and his fellows were going to be punished for the sins of others. For the lacking of others, did Daniel fail to, to give this interpretation at this point? Absolutely not. Yet, since he is considered part of the wise men of Babylon, he is now set to be slain. 
Verse 14, then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, which has gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Ariok made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made known the thing or made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, that they should desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise 